So my name is Maximo Torero. Uh, we will have two presentations today uh, on this session, which is for light and agricultural commodity prices and instability along the food value chain. Uh, the first present presenter will be Christi Christoph Buell from INRA, and the second one will be Meg Hayley from CEF. So it is to have 10 minutes presentation each one, and then we can open for, for discussion. Okay, so Christoph, have 10 minutes. Simple rules. They do not combine well with trade, 
they are very, it's very difficult to choose uh, the good bounds. So good simple rules are just using simple subsidy to storage and simple counter cyclical trade policy. And this will help uh, create predictability of policy interventions and help build a private marketing system. Uh, but nonetheless, as I told you, that's only second best policy and social safety nets would, be, uh, would achieve more welfare. The problem is that even if we can design nice uh, theoretical optimal policies, in real life, stabilization policies have had quite mixed effects, to say the least. Storage policies were often quite ineffective, with grants stored for way too long, with very high storage costs and deteriorations. As you can see here, you have wheat storage in India. Wheat is often uh, stored outside, just under top, uh, so with very high deterioration. And, so, and storage policies have been often captured by farm lobbies, uh, meaning that instead of stabilizing prices, they tended to increase mean price. Uh, on the other hand, trade policies have been more effective at stabilizing domestic prices, but with a lot of heterogeneity. So some countries, such as India and China, have been very effective at stabilizing the domestic price in the short run while accommodating the long run uh, change in the world price. <coughs> but this is not the case in all countries. And especially in Africa, we have observed many more distorted interventions than in Asia. The issue is that if trade policies are effective, they are also non-cooperative. So they will hurt uh, trade partners. And they are more effective for exporting countries during price spikes than for importing countries. So, the policy implication of this research is that we are facing an issue of coordination. First, there is an issue of coordination at the international level. Uh, stabilization policies react to world price volatility, but world <coughs> price volatility is also caused by the stabilization <coughs> policies that export domestic volatility to the world market. And this is really a new challenge for the multilateral trade system. Because the price spikes create very strong incentives for exporting countries to use the export restriction. And they are unwilling to lose this flexibility in, uh, in the <coughs> multilateral system. So they refuse any discipline uh, in the WTO. And anyway, even if disciplines were agreed on, the WTO dispute system is not designed to handle such short lived policies. So we have a problem here to, to, add, to address this issue. And on this, we can say that developed countries should be exemplary. And they have been kind of since, contrary to the first food crisis in 1972 uh, 74 they have refrained from using export taxes and export restrictions. But on the other hand, they have used quite a few policies that triggered part, part of the price tax and part of the policy reaction. And secondly, the issue of coordination is domestically, because price stabilization policies can only be credibly reduced if they are replaced by policies that are as effective for protecting poor people. And so which means that social safety nets should play a role of insurance. And usually, they are designed to alleviate poverty, but not, not to be adjusted in the very short run of, of price spikes. And for th that's why many policymakers will use trade policies because they are much faster and much easier to use than adjusting the safety nets. And if we want these policies to be implemented credibly, um, some commitment has to be taken with respect to private agents because private stores and private traders will refuse to step in if their profits can be wiped out by <coughs> policy decisions. So now we have a equity yeah. concept, and then after that we will have the opening policy statement by Carl Johan and then from the uh, Thank you very much. I'm Michael Pyle from the Center for Development <coughs> Research. Um, I will be presenting a, a narrower uh, in, in its scope compared to what Christoph uh, presented, but it's uh, directly or indirectly affected by the policies, uh, be it the storage policies or the trade policies that uh, Christoph presented. And it's a transmission of price shocks from the international market and also from the, uh, in the domestic market within um, the wheat grade value chain in the East Africa. Uh, to give you a brief context of um, uh, the importance of the wheat market or this value chain in Ethiopia, 
um, um, which is a very important grain uh, in, in the country, which provides about 15% of the caloric demand of more than 90 million of, uh, uh, people of the country. Uh, and that makes it kind of second to maize uh, in the country. And it also contributes or makes up about 20% of the, the domestic cereal production, um, uh, which is about 2.5 to 3 million metric ton um, uh, on average every year. Um, and the most, uh, it's actually the most important staple food crop, if not the single uh, food crop uh, that the country imports. And in about uh, six or seven years out of the, the, the previous 15 years, it actually import, uh, contributed to as high as 40% of the total domestic production in the country. So in that sense, um, it's a, a market and a crop that links the international market with the domestic market. And um, uh, where this import dependency, a large import, exposes the domestic food market to shocks and uh, volatility from the international market. For example, following the 2007-8 food crisis, imported wheat actually was like twice uh, the amount of domestic market surplus in, in, the, in the domestic market. And, um, following that, uh, between um, in these five months between April and August. Um, there was a, a, an increase of the wheat grain by about 60 percent, and also uh, wheat flour and wheat bread have also increased by about 30 percent and 40 percent. Um, the framework, the value chain that I will be presenting, will just a simplified version of the framework will really look like this one. Uh, so um, the brown shaded um, uh, box there is international wheat price, and the shaded brown because it represents small economies. So it's kind of exogenous factor in the system, but the other gray uh, shaded uh, boxes refer to markets in the domestic value chain of wheat. Uh, so uh, the, the, these are the arrows that I will kind of make a uh, chat or see how shocks transmit from one box to, to the other box. In general, these are the two types of pressure transmissions that we investigated. One, as I indicated, the, the shock transmission from the international wheat market to the domestic market, but not just at the farm yet or at the grain level, but down to the bottom stream, the, 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 the downstream of the value chain, and also transmission of shock within the domestic market and along the value chain. Just the data, briefly, this is a raw, real uh, price data of wheat and wheat products. Um, um, one general thing I could say is there is general co-movement of prices of wheat grain as well as wheat product uh, prices there. Uh, but the kind of three tier, if you like, of uh, prices at the top, you see the downstream prices, including the bread price, the wheat bread price, and the wheat flour price. And at the bottom, you see this, um, the, the, the red one is the producer price, except in case of well, the early 2000s, where there was a bumper harvest, and the producer price was really low. Uh, and if you see the, uh, the bread price there was really high, so this is kind of market integration problem um, uh, across the country. But later, uh, more or less, you see a co-movement of general similar trade in, in price quality. This is kind of similar, but this is a market markup, uh, a price margin or markup between the downstream and the upstream prices in the country, and it's a, a striking decline in the markup of prices along the value chain. So, for example, to, to give uh, you some uh, perspective of how to interpret this one, uh, if I take the red uh, uh, line, for example, it's the price difference between wheat grain price and uh, wheat grain producer price. And it was about, uh, uh, in, uh, in 2001 or so, it was about, uh, <coughs> converting it to metric ton, or 150 euro metric ton markup different, difference between uh, bread price and producer wheat grain price, which actually declined to less than 50 euro per metric ton uh, in uh, 2010 and later. So it's a striking uh, decline in the price markup between the different markets uh, uh, along the value chain in the country, which reflects uh, uh, better functioning of markets, efficiency, lowering transaction costs and processing costs along the value chain. So the key results about the transmission of the shocks along the value chain uh, on this international market actually there's a shock, strong shock transmission from the international wheat market to the domestic market 
and astonishingly, it's stronger in the downstream uh, market prices, especially the wheat flow uh, and wheat retail uh, 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 markets in the country, but less so against uh, statistically significant uh, short transmission, but it's less uh, uh, weaker in the case of the producer market. Which, of course, tells us that um, these shocks at the international market have differential impact on producers and consumers in the country. In other words, um, the positive shock in the international market have um, a stronger negative impact on Ethiopian consumers compared to its positive impact on the producers locally. Um, the other result is that the upstream markets, uh, this transmission of shocks is stronger from the upstream markets, which is the wholesale market and the producer market, to the downstream market than uh, vice versa. And especially this wholesale market, the wholesale price is actually kind of the dictating price of all the other markets along the value chain, uh, which kind of gives us a clue that prices and price expectations in the country are uh, kind of formed at the upstream of the, the, the wheat grade value chain in the country, particularly at the wholesale market. And at the bottom of the, the wheat grade value chain is the, uh, the grade market where the short transmission to and from this market are quite contained or limited. There's a small uh, transmission to this market and also um, from the other markets, referring that there are other costs now gaining more importance, including labor costs, housing, and electricity, and of course, other demand factors also play a role in, in determining the price of grade than the other, the other prices along the value chain. Just to give you a concluding remark, the first thing is this import is kind of entirely administered by the, by the government, import of wheat, and the prices are also uh, administered by the, by the government with the aim that the government can insulate the domestic market from shocks in the international market. But what we have seen is that this is not entirely possible to mitigate or insulate the country from shocks in the international market. Of course, we cannot say that the shock transmission may be stronger if the policy were, were not there, but uh, without a proper counter. And the other key point is the wheat wholesale market is a kind of a dictating or leading market uh, along the value chain. And um, if policymakers want to have a good signal or early warning about price developments along the value chain in the other market states, this is a market that they, they should give particular attention to. And that uh, declining trend in the, in the price markup along the value chain that we have seen downstream and upstream prices, so on the one hand, uh, reflects declining transaction cost and processing cost along the value chain, so improved efficiency and market integration, uh, which in a way is welfare improving both to the consumers and the uh, producers. But on the other hand, what it means is also a stronger shock transmission along the value chain, which may not be a, a positive thing for, for consumers. Uh, one thing which I didn't really mention is adjustment to shocks along the value chain is there. Adjust adjustments happen, but they, they are delayed and they are very slow, which may be indicative of still existing high transaction costs and the presence of market power and several agents along the value chain and also information asymmetry uh, that exists in the country in the wheat grade value chain, which of course gives a policy implication that it may be important to improve the infrastructure along the value chain in the country and also improve the market information system in the country. Thank you. So now we invite Carl Jotan Linden from the DRP. to to come here uh, I will try to address this issue it's a very very broad subject that uh, our session has been, been asked to cover volatility and the functioning of the food chain that can be uh, uh, very very many different kind of things then in my uh, shorter policy address I'll address uh, mainly the functioning of the food chain and the current ongoing debate from the European perspective just here so I will be a little bit different from, from, from previous speakers but I hope that can be, be helpful in order to, to, uh, to trigger a discussion then later on uh, I work in a unit uh, uh, responsible for economic outlook, although I don't have a scientific background at all myself, so I work on the policy part in the unit then. 
uh, this functioning of the food chain is, uh, uh, is in the center of the political debate uh, at the moment, uh, very much in, in uh, Europe at least, but I sense that this is the case also to some extent outside Europe, and depends on which, which regions we, we, are, we are referring to. This imbalance in bargaining power between um, usually weaker farmers, stronger uh, food industry retailers uh, is, is an old one. It has been ongoing for 100 years, or 100 years plus actually. Uh, 100 years ago we had the discussion on formation of cooperatives in order to strengthen bargaining power for farmers, at least in Northern Europe, uh, but also in other parts of the world, and which, is, which has been very relevant and actually in positive experience all over them. Uh, that doesn't mean that by definition if there is a cooperative active on the market that the food chain works well, then that, that's to, to stretch things a little bit too far then. Uh, I think the issue of the functioning of the food chain increases in political importance uh, throughout some kind of crisis or in terms of uh, periods of, of, of high volatility as um, uh, previous speakers has referred to. And just now this year, uh, the one reason to why it's very active uh, in, in my policy area is of course for the, the, the ongoing dairy crisis in Europe but also outside uh, Europe where farmers are suffering and uh, farmers are asking themselves where is that value of meat actually ending up then? Uh, I think the, the debate as such is addressing mainly the use of something that we call unfair trading practices along the food chain, uh, less of, of bargaining power. But what is then unfair trading practices? Uh, that is something which is disrupting the functioning of the chain uh, uh, very, very clearly, and it's something that needs to be addressed then. Examples of unfair trading practices can be late payments to farmers, uh, a big, strength, uh, powerful uh, industry retailer is using the, the financial strength to try to squeeze a, a less uh, strong actor, paying late, liquidity problems, uh, farmers have to, uh, to go out of business then. It's a problem in Europe, but it's also a, a very relevant problem outside Europe in one or another way then. There can be listing fees for having the products on the shelves, for example. There can be uh, undue termination of contracts without any prior notice. Uh, simply that uh, a manufacturer or, or even a farm is thrown out from the, the retail shelf and uh, can't sell his or her products. And uh, of course, income is, is uh, suffering uh, heavily from that. Uh, this is a problem which is, occurs all along the food chain. Uh, in the European perspective, I think it's relevant uh, as well. Farmers uh, versus uh, industry, uh, industry versus retailers, or that can be in, in terms of, 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 of in cases where the food chain is shorter, farmers to retailers as well. Then it, it's a problem all through them. We have had a discussion for uh, almost ten years uh, in Europe at more political level, in different kind of high-level forums for a better functioning of the food chain. Uh, discussions have been good. One can of course ask oneself, but after 10 years, uh, what, what's the outcome actually? What has happened then? Uh, critical voices say, well, not very much. Uh, this is still a problem. Farmers are, are paid uh, very little for a high quality product. Uh, the added value in the chain stops elsewhere then. Uh, there has been a couple of voluntary initiatives and also partly uh, national legislation adopted by member states then. Uh, and I would say that the, the situation has de facto improved and it is still a problem but the situation has improved in, in the food chain. And so some kind of outcome we have had from, uh, uh, from, from the discussions then. Uh, from the Commission side, we are following the situation uh, very, very closely from, from different angles, from the purely political angle, uh, but of course in the broader sense then, a, a, a malfunctioning or a poorly functioning food chain will have uh, effects on the whole economy, jobs and growth uh, and so on in, in the longer run then. It also has uh, effects on, on our relation to, to, to third countries in, in one or another way then. So this is a politically prioritized issue now. And uh, the national legislation, as I referred to uh, as such, uh, from the Commission side, we realize that uh, the situation has improved, but there is also a threat of, of taking national measures in, in this respect. Uh, we have an internal market, which is a core function of the European Union that needs to be ensured, uh, good function of that needs to be ensured then. We have important trade relations from, from uh, the, the Union uh, versus uh, a lot of third countries and different kinds of standards uh, uh, coming up in, in discussion adopted as legislation is something which is a potential threat to the function of the chain then. and that is something that we are clearly monitoring, we are monitoring it, it even very closely then to ensure the functioning of, of, of uh, the, the, the internal market then. Uh, we are now uh, coming to a point where we have uh, 
main actors, main political actors, uh, uh, realizing that uh, we have an ongoing discussion, the situation has improved, there is still a problem, uh, the added value stops somewhere, uh, we can do more on this, uh, this area then. Uh, we have very clear calls from, uh, for example, European Parliament, uh, Economic and Social Committee, uh, we have internally set up a task force for, for uh, monitoring the functioning of the agricultural markets. We have the Council of Ministers uh, discussing, discussing the issue. And, and I would say, my personal assessment at least, is that the, the trend is now uh, going much more towards a discussion clearly on uh, common legislation on this end, which will of course affect the, 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 the market and so on. Uh, it's a question of what to do, and the discussion is going that way. That doesn't mean that the Commission takes action, then, because it's not so simple from the Commission side to say that yes, because so we sense that the political debate is, is uh, going one direction, the next day we'll take the legislative proposal. No, that, that's to simplify things then. And I would say that there is a need of, of um, uh, further knowledge uh, in, in, in this field then. And in, in particular, when it comes to the price transmission mechanism, which previous speakers touched a little bit on, uh, although from, from a different angle then, where does the added value in the food chain uh, stop then? We know that the last couple of years, the last year I should say, probably, uh, the farm gate price of milk in Europe, but also relevant, for example, in Oceania, uh, has dropped by 30%. Uh, and then as consumers, as, as we all are, we can also realize uh, what has happened with the price of liquid milk, yogurt, cheese, etc., uh, on the shelf in the supermarket? Then uh, I would say, without having a scientific uh, uh, proof of that, that uh, it has dropped less, considerably less than. So margins has clearly stopped somewhere uh, along the chain. Then, and then this to to follow the price transmission mechanism. What happens there? We know that it's far from perfect, but we have very little data on it. Uh, to be honest, and very little useful data on it. And of course, this is an important uh, uh, component if the Commission decides to take action here, certainly. I know that this is a difficult area, uh, challenges with different models, uh, both within the Union but also versus third countries, uh, different type of service content in, uh, added into a product. To buy milk uh, in the countryside, the uh, retail store, uh, somewhere Wednesday afternoon is a completely different thing than buying it in the city centre late Sunday evening. Then the service content is, is completely different. Then we are measuring in, in, in a way we have a litre of milk is a litre of milk, yes, but it's sold with a, a different service uh, uh, content. We have different type of labelling requests, we have different type of product categories. Uh, uh, of course, if it uh, comes through, then in, in countries where uh, the chain is built up with very much of home cooking, processing raw material all the way through, or if you come to other countries where you basically buy deep frozen products uh, directly from the shelf, then uh, of course it's a different service content in, in, in the products as well, then, which makes it difficult to, to, to address this price transmission mechanism and how it works. Then. Because in the end, uh, in one another way, uh, uh, from the policy side, we will be asked, we will have to answer the question, does this unfair trading practices, whatever they are, late payments, etc., etc., uh, do they make that the that, uh, uh, value added stays in the chain? Is it a problem of these unfair trading practices? Or is it actually more a problem of, of bargaining power along the chain? Then? Farmers are weaker versus industry and retail. Uh, or is it uh, more, more a problem of of competition throughout the chain. There's a limited competition and some, some steps. Uh, uh, it disrupts the functioning of the chain uh, and therefore the margin stops uh, somewhere then. And this is very relevant for the income of the European farmers, but I think also applicable uh, far outside Europe. Then. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me invite the three speakers to the front so that we can start a little bit the dialogue um, and I will open to questions. I will only have one question on my side before we start and then we can open. Uh, so, uh, three questions. One to uh, uh, Christoph. Uh, you, you were talking about the, the first best option and, and trying to see how openness and trade mobility will help to, to reduce this problem of, of volatility and so on. Now, what can we do to change the way things are moving right now, because what we are observing in the world is a little, dif a little bit different towards more trade. Uh, many of the political views are kind of contrary to that. So what will be your, your, your recommendation in that sense? 
for for uh, maybe uh, Ethiopia is a different country in the sense that it has a lot of controls behind, and specifically in the case of wheat, uh, especially for the bread production, there is, if I, I am not wrong, there is a quota uh, in terms of, of, of wheat import. So that constrains a lot, the, and I think it reflects why you are finding very little price transmission in terms of international prices to the bread production. Uh, so if you can elaborate a little bit what are the costs and benefits of those type of policies and, and, and who is paying for those, because somebody is paying for those type of, of lack of price transmission. Uh, and finally, uh, for, for, for uh, Mr. Carl Johan, uh, one question related to the, to the risk. Uh, so in all this uneven uh, market structure that you were talking about between buyers, the, the corporate buying from the producers, uh, one of the major issues is how they push the risk to the farmers uh, and how they can diversify the risk by doing that so that they can basically sell. And, and my question is more related to how much having better information uh, for farmers could help to reduce that potential problem uh, outside, of course, of, of what you were referring to, horizontal coordination through corporate or, or farmer associations. Uh, but, but how much a public good system that creates better information on prices on, on who is supplying to be able to increase the competition uh, and, and the buying and selling could help to, to reduce the transmission of risk. So, first question, but now I open. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, I have two questions. <laughs> the first question is uh, you said a lot about uh, uh, storage subsidies as a means to increase storage. I think that's a, that, that, that's a good idea. My question, however, is the following. First, how do you define the optimal storage that you should aim at? And second, uh, have there been, except for the United States and Europe, any other experiences in developing countries with storage subsidies? Now, my question for maybe <coughs> you had this very nice graph of the, um, uh, of the margins which were falling down. Now, uh, it is the case that um, when there is monopoly along the value chain, what you observe is uh, a transmission when the prices go up and a non-transmission when the prices go down. So the question is whether you have or can use this uh, analysis to detect uh, uh, market power along the value chain. So if you do an analysis of the margin and you see the margin behaving in a non-symmetric way, then you can infer to some extent that there is monopoly in that particular part of the value chain. Have you or anybody else done this in Ethiopia? Any other question in this first round? Yes? Do you have a question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, Alan Matthews. Uh, if I could follow up uh, the, the uh, storage question from Aleko to, to Christoph and, and put it uh, specifically in the European Union context. I mean, in the past, uh, we used to have a, a very uh, pithy phrase that, uh, you know, when Europe raised its prices to farmers, it lowered prices for the rest of the world. When Europe stabilized its prices for its farmers, it destabilized prices for the rest of the world. But that was because the stabilization was through trade policy. We, as you rightly point out, we moved away from trade policy, but we still have storage uh, policies. And I just wanted, it within the model that you've been using, and you mentioned this idea that uh, the, a fixed subsidy is, is, uh, is, the, uh, is the appropriate uh, uh, policy. What do you, how do you evaluate the European Union's current storage policies? We have both public intervention for some commodities, uh, we have aid for private storage uh, for others. Um, they're somewhat discretionary. Uh, um, uh, they, they seem to be cooperative in the sense that uh, if you take the milk, uh, the recent uh, milk crisis, and uh, we bought uh, uh, dairy products uh, into in intervention. I mean, that raises the price a little bit in Europe, but it also raises it for New Zealand and, and the United States, which also have low prices. So is that a cooperative solution uh, as opposed to uh, using trade policies? So within your model, maybe just I'm asking you to comment a little bit on, on how the European Union uh, uses these instruments uh, to stabilize and, and uh, do you think that we do it well? Any other 
risk along the food chain and better information to farmers and, and uh, how this will link into the better functioning food chain. I think it was a, a very good I would like to, to link to, to one of the questions asked by, by the audience here and let's say that uh, uh, in terms of a, a, a price drop then, then it's very very quickly pushed on uh, to the farmer in, in, in case of price increase then it's not necessarily going so fast uh, through the food chain or the reverse engineering upstream the, the, the food chain then. Uh, I, I made the example uh, uh, when I was uh, in the presentation uh, of uh, the 30% drop in farm gate price. Uh, what do we see? What effects do we see in the retail uh, chain then? Well, I would say at least less than 30%. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, comparing apples and pears here then. Uh, I think the, the question there is more a question of bargaining power then and, and how, how we can address the, the issue of risk then. And in practice, what, what can a farmer do then? Uh, the unfair trading practices then, uh, the, the, the addressing the, the risk issue and saying that uh, a price as such, a low price is an unfair trading practice, well, I don't think we can stretch it so far then. It, uh, it's a question of other type of, of, of functioning of food chain uh, and the bargaining power issue is, is there, uh, certainly one of them. What we're seeing, good examples, uh, I'm speaking a lot from the European arena, is then, uh, of course, the, the, the cooperatives and the cooperatives creation of critical mass to, to handle risk in one or another way, either through collective buying, collective selling, uh, or to being big enough to use various types of financial instruments uh, to, to hedge risk uh, throughout the chain then, uh, and also pass it on uh, to, to later stages. Uh, that, that's for sure one thing then. Uh, we have other measures on, on producer organizations. Uh, again, producers are, are, are forming organizations to go together to, to use uh, some kind of collective bargaining this is something that we have addressed uh, throughout uh, various uh, policy reforms the last 10, 15 years, I would say, and, and putting uh, an increased effort on that. And that is because we also sense uh, from the policy making in the Commission, the Council of Ministers, European Parliament, and so on, that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. And, uh, and uh, I would say that, that the, uh, the question there is very much linked to the bargaining power uh, cooperation between farmers then, in order to handle it from one sector. So I, I think I, I stopped with that. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, maybe? Yeah, I think the two questions for me are quite related. Um, the government controls the, the wheat market, especially the import. Importing wheat is entirely done by the government. Um, and it distributes part of the, the wheat to wholesalers in the country, uh, to selected wholesalers, um, depending on some eligibility criteria. And part of uh, the wheat imported goes to uh, the millers directly. And these two institutions, or these two groups, or, or the wholesalers and the, the millers are uh, given a predefined price uh, uh, at which they have to sell to the next level, to the retailers and so on. So um, the import is under a, control, a complete monopoly of the government, and it's under subsidy. So it's really a <coughs> subsidy. So the rate which comes from the imported wheat is a subsidized price, and there's not a lot of fluctuation in that price. So that's not the price that I'm using when, uh, when I do the analysis here. But um, the price that I'm using uh, for the wheat grade is from the open market, which I think will be anyways influenced by this subsidized price. So that's the link really that, that I'm using. And who pays for, for these policies? I think it's kind of redistributive policy where the taxpayers have to pay, and then um, later, Great consumers benefit from that contract. I guess it's a uh, well kept improving in that sense. Uh, um, and uh, so, in relation to the second one, then, uh, because it's a subsidized one, I would of course see that uh, shops transmit when prices increase because the government also increases this price. But the government is not willing to reduce the price when they go down because it was already a subsidized one and uh, doesn't want to make more subsidies. Is reduced. That's the link I, I would see in this asymmetry of transmission when there is increase in prices, but not when they will decline. But to be honest, I have not really looked at that one, but that's what I, I would think of answer that question. Okay, thank you, Christopher. Okay, um, let's first take your question. So, what can we do about the increase in production? Um, I think the first question here is that do we really observe? 
a new surge in prediction, a new structural surge, or is it just a reaction of trade protection to the low world prices? Because we have seen in the past that when prices are low, uh, countries increase their protection. And so it would be, we would expect them to do the same uh, uh, currently. Uh, and we know that countries have a lot, are, are, at least they have some policy space, they can use uh, export taxes, they have a lot of space to move between uh, below their bond rate at the WTO. And um, I think that we cannot see in the WTO much, much improvement in the future with respect to reduce this policy space. So I'm not really uh, optimistic about uh, disinclining countercyclical trade policies about uh, I projects. I think that they are here to stay and we do not move further uh, and very much in the WTO, uh, it, will not, it will not change. Um, so I have a question about uh, storage policies. So first, how to define the optimal storage level. Um, so in, in my model, you you do not define an optimal storage level, you define what is an optimal storage room. So how stock level should react to uh, the situation in the market, to the domestic availability, the world availability, the exchange rate, and all of this. There is no such thing as an optimal stock level, because you do not want to reach a level, and reach a stock level, and always stay at this level. So it does not make sense. So you need to be able to react up, uh, to how things change. Um, that's the point of using a subsidy to storage because it decentralizes the decision to agents that should be good at uh, making interpretable decisions because this is their job and a lot of their money because if we get a subsidy to do more stockpiling but anyway, if they, if they should sell everything now because the price is very high that's their job to do it and it's not always what government will do uh, so what do we have experience in developing countries with uh, storage subsidy? With respect to direct storage subsidy, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know any uh, experience uh, like this. I remember a paper by Gardner uh, saying that in Latin, in Latin American countries, at some point in their history, they have used subsidies to interest rates for uh, stockpilers. Uh, but he also explained that subsidies to interest rate are not that uh, efficient. Uh, in India, you have some subsidies to uh, the investment in public uh, in uh, stockpiling facilities, in addition to public stockpiling. The direct storage subsidies that we have seen in the US and in Europe are I don't know. Um, so Alan, you, what can we say about the storage subsidy without trade? without a trade policy. Um, if we think about the trade-off between trade and storage policy, we can imagine that for a very small country connected to the world market, obviously the trade policy is the best choice. And the larger the country, the more the storage policy should, should have a role to play. And evidently, at some point, if the country is as large as the world, there will be only storage policy to do. Um, but when you do a storage policy and you are large, you affect the rest of the world. So you have a very generous policy. And there are a lot of chances that it may not benefit uh, the European market. At least it may have some benefit, but the cost may outweigh the same. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's likely, uh, but we, we have to do the calculation. Um, about the nature of the policy, something that has always uh, me in European policy, but mostly in, in storage policies in general all over the world, the world is that storage policies are very clear about the buying price. So we know what is the intervention price, so the government will buy tons of wheat at this price. But usually the policies are perfectly discretionary with respect to the, to the selling price. And that's why stocks tend to be um, old for too long because the incentive to sell are weak and government do not want to hurt farmers. And we have the same issues we, in Europe. So the, the selling of stocks it has no clear rule. And this is a decision, uh, I don't know if it's in the Commission or the Council, but anyway, uh, this is a, a purely discretionary decision. And usually, uh, it's not well-packed. But at least, this is a cooperative policy. 
and so we, we cannot argue against this. Okay, thank you. Any other question from the audience? Okay, so while you think, I have one more. So Christoph, uh, you talk about the, the, the storage rule, but what is your trigger to release stocks? So how your model takes into account uh, when to release the stocks, specifically because that's linked to a problem that you want to resolve with the stocks, no? And you were talking about price bands and the problems behind price bands. So what is your rule to, to release stocks? Uh, and also how your model includes institutional design uh, of these type of policies. Uh, so how are the institutions involved in the model? Uh, maybe I am still not, not, not clear about the... Because uh, the wheat market and in Ethiopia, together with exchange rate uh, controls, uh, clearly affects the, even your open market price transmission mechanism. So, so what we can do or what you will advise countries like Ethiopia to try to minimize that potential uh, transmission of volatility or the distortions that it, this type of, of international market shocks could have in the, in the local markets, uh, uh, despite all the controls that you have in place in, in, in volatility. And the last, uh, uh, to the uh, is there anything we can learn from contract farming design in Europe uh, that could help to reduce this uh, unequal power between buyers and sellers that, that you were referring? Is there any regulation on contract farming designs in Europe that could help us to learn in, in developing countries to try to minimize this unbalanced power? Any question from the audience? Yes. About, uh, we always talk about stocks as uh, physical stocks. I was wondering, if, have you thought about uh, virtual stocks? What I mean is that at the end of the day, uh, this kind of price fluctuation is related to some kind of rigidity of the supply curve. So can you imagine some kind of uh, policy to have uh, a flatter, more elastic supply? I was thinking in terms of some of the policies uh, we adopted in Europe, for example, something like set aside. Of course, if land is not changing irreversibly with some kind of building or shopping center, it would be easier if there is a price spike to bring it back to Russia. So, is there any thought in this, uh, along this line of thinking? Uh, I have another question. The stock rules that uh, you are using, and almost everybody has used, these are quantity rules, namely the amount of stock out as a function of the stocking plus production. And of course, this is challenging in terms of the information needed. Um, but suppose that you can do it, and then you have a target level of stock for this year, for this period. Then you can use your subsidy to reach that level of stock. Uh, is that how you envision these things working in practice or some other way? Okay, no other question? Okay, so we have seven minutes, so two minutes each, and uh, we go in the reverse. Christoph, you want to start? Okay, um, so what trigger to release the stocks? Um, so my work has focused on storage room. So usually there is no trigger. You release or you buy stocks depending on the market condition. But you may have trigger if you consider simple rules, such as price band. And in this case, you define the trigger to work uh, as close as possible to the optimal rule. Um, so that's that's related to your question. I I consider constant subsidy to storage, but you may uh, consider uh, a more flexible policy with a subsidy that change depending on the market condition. But in this case, you have a more complex policy. So that's something a bit more difficult to design. So it depends how much uh, close you want to be to the optimal policy. Uh, so that's a choice. I would like to say that in this literature, we have. Uh, simple models, and they are still quite far from um, realistic situation. And for example, that model only of animal market. We are not able to type, to deal with uh, interest animal market, with news shocks, and I think that all the, a lot of things are happening with respect to news shocks. How should a uh, 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 public uh, manager of stocks react to news shock on the world market? And that's something very difficult to, uh, to manage. Um, instead of doing stocks, can we increase the flexibility of uh, the produce of, of supply? Um, you are right that we, we did it uh, previously, and it was also the case in the US. Um, 
one issue here is that this kind of currency can also to be manipulated to raise the bin price and not just to stabilize prices. Uh, it can have an effect, but if we expect that uh, supply going to be quite inelastic, it's quite costly also to make it react uh, strongly and to use it to stabilize the market. So I'm not overly confident on this, but if we say that biofuels are here to stay, we could uh, use a bit of biofuel policies to provide some uh, flexibility by uh, adjusting the mandate depending on the market uh, tightness. So that would be the one solution. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that the price of transmission goes to the European countries or to other countries because the, the import of the fiscal case is quite limited. So I don't really see this reverse um, impact on, um, on other countries. But of course, uh, I'm not saying that this controlled um, trade policy in the country is a good thing. And uh, of course, the alternative is to open up uh, import for private traders in the country as well. Um, that would, of course, make it more competitive. Um, and um, But the country or the government believes that it's a, a key crop because it's kind of the only, even if recently Ethiopia has started importing a huge amount of rice. But uh, um, it's kind of key crop which links the international market with the domestic market and should be kind of looked at uh, very carefully. Um, so one way forward is to open up trade for private um, traders as well. But also there is a story policy in the country has to they call it a buffer stock that's really more than that one. So um, that could also be kind of a better monitor and control or work more uh, um, with price signals others and, and of course I have to be very, very prudent here. Uh, I think the European model as, as it has developed uh, to increase bargaining power has been uh, definitely uh, successful over the years then. Uh, then as I, I touched on before then nothing is so good so you can't be improved and uh, not even the, the food chain by the way and so certainly this is something to work on but uh, this type of collective, collective bargaining uh, formation of, of the uh, cooperatives Spend, and we do spend uh, quite some resources, public funds on, on uh, uh, encouraging farmers to go together and produce all the and so on, uh, has been successful and it has worked here. And whether it will work, for example, in the situation in Ethiopia, that you uh, refer to, we need a completely different institutional structure, and different economic structure, different political structure, and so on. I don't dare to answer that question, and I can just refer to that to the examples. And, If I try to link it to the stock, since uh, a lot of questions were raised on, on stock, and, and uh, we also had quite some discussion of it, and again looking at, at the measures taken uh, in the Union, at least historically, intervention to some, uh, uh, as, as one example, maybe to some extent private storage as well, and what the, the, the CAP uh, has done there is to create another uh, outlet, uh, another buyer, another market actor. Then. So in case of absence of other uh, actors on the market, then this is at least guaranteed a, a bottom price then, which is of course in terms of bargaining power for a farmer, then saying that if, if to pay the don't have a grain demand, then this is uh, a public intervention, and that's not the reason, that's not the rationale of the system, but um, uh, certainly it, 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 uh, it, it can be used like that. Looking back to the last, uh, or the dairy crisis we had uh, 2009-2010, then, uh, then there we can also realize that uh, when there were an absence of, of buyers in, in many member states actually uh, for meat and then the intervention played a very, very important role then. and looking at it from a, a commission perspective, EU perspective then there we at least managed to buy uh, cheap and, and sell pretty expensive when the market went up uh, and then the, the stock was released uh, which pulled down the market considerably then. Again, uh, the aim of the measure was to stabilize the market uh, not to, to, to invest So thank you so much to all of you and please join me in, in, in thanking the, the speakers.